Okay, good work guys. Um, obviously neurosurgery, a really massive topic and I'm just trying to get you the crux of what's, you know, I think is really important um, uh, for the SAQ and the Viva, just to keep it as exam focused as possible. Uh, good, so positional issues. I've never seen that jackknife position done. Uh, that looks difficult to operate with. Okay, so often there's a question, what are the hazards of some position for patients under general anesthesia and how can they be minimized? I thought I'll just run through my framework that I use for this when I did the short answer questions. So that I found that a lot of these short answer question ideal answers had something really reasonable to start off like a summary statement saying the hazards relate to the position itself, the patient comorbidities and the type of surgery in relation to the position. So think about that answer. If you just read this question, what are the hazards of a position? You may just talk about one aspect of three, you know, potentially three aspects or potentially even more. Maybe I've forgotten something here, but you know, in this exam, especially in the short answer questions, you have to go broad to get as many marks as possible because you don't, you can't always mind read what the examiners want. So I'll talk about the position itself and chuck in some patient comorbidities and chuck in the type of surgery and how it relates to the position. So physiological stuff that I might talk about, which are impaired or improved. So respiratory function may be improved in some positions like sitting, uh, but cardiovascularly, it may be worse because of blood pressure issues, increased risk of venous air embolism. Maybe you've got issues with high, high pressures in the intracranial cavity, uh, nerve injuries, prone positions can increase ophthalmic injury. And then posterior fossa has a whole bunch of issues, not, not just venous air embolism, but laryngeal edema, pneumocephalus and quadriplegia. Um, because it's working on, around the brainstem. Uh, then pressure injuries uh, because of the position can be useful and accessibility. Another you know, roundabout way of talking about a whole other aspect of things that could occur during the case. Uh, and I also add in there crisis management may be more difficult depending on the position. So imagine getting someone out of prone position for a crisis to do CPR or do whatever is far more difficult. Um, again, Talking broadly helps you get all the marks for, the, for these kind of questions. And then we talk about risk minimization. So uh, in this question, often they might ask and how they can be minimized. So that's the next part of the question. And so risk minimization means pre-op assessment. So again, thinking broadly, I'm assessing the patient for all their other problems that may increase their risk. Careful positioning with staff, pressure care, padding, anesthesis for the airway, C-spine and head, avoiding disconnections of all your vital you know, monitoring devices and things and ventilation, and then monitoring and access and potentially, um, yeah, it's outline two drips, extension tubing, securing the lines really well. And, uh, and then, you know, your various monitoring things for posterior fossa surgery. Okay. So awake crany. And I'll just give it, maybe other people have come in. Has anyone done an awake craniotomy before? Would anyone, does anyone know it well in theory who wants to talk about it? Just to practice talking about it. I was talking to a consultant about it the other day because there was one happening in Excellent. one of the other theaters. And that's, I just, that's better than me. Let's get, let, let's talk about it. <laughs> um, well, something that I, I hadn't really considered it. So it's often, often done for uh, like placement of a deep brain stimulator for someone with Parkinsonism or yep. Parkinson's disease. Um, and I, what I hadn't considered is that some of this can be done with burr hole surgery alone. And so mm. uh, I had sort of always considered this as, craniectomy, mm. you know, full dissection down. And I was confused as to how you'd be able to cover the, the periosteum and bone for such a wide area. Yes. Um, and so the first interesting thing was that the one that they were doing was burr hole related yes. um, placement. And so the, the actual stimulation to the skin can be quite easily covered with a scalp block. Um, yep. And uh, the, the periosteum is the next part. The actual bone itself apparently isn't too stimulating. Mm -hmm. And the periosteum itself, um, yeah, is covered by the scalp block. Yes. Beyond that, they tend to use a dexmedetomidine infusion for the sedation. So they don't go off to sleep and then wake up yes. in, in their practice. Yes. They just use a dexmed infusion. And then they, it sounds as though most people I've spoken to don't use um, a bolus of that anymore. They just run an infusion. Yes. This person started at 0. 0.8. Yes. Um, and yeah. then once they start seeing some, sorry? 0. 0.8 mics per kilo per minute. Yeah, or per hour. I think it is. Like a kilo per hour. Sorry, that would be more, right? Yep. Um, and then once they start getting, uh, they start seeing some effects, they'll halve it to 0. 0.4. Yep. Uh, the case. So th they were just the main points that I 
No, that's good. So okay. yeah, like to go through systematically then the indication. Yeah. So anytime you need to know what's going on and ideally deep brain stimulation is really important like that for epilepsy, um, stimulation, lesion of deep brain, nuclei for Parkinson's, yep. Space occupying lesion adjacent to really important areas of the cortex. Maybe it's tumor section near sensory motor or speech areas. These are all pretty good indications. So that's, you know, anytime it's vital that you don't, you know, go through a substance that's really important. Um, and then communicate, so confusion, communication, anxiety, these are obviously some contraindications, inability to lie still, significant dural involvement. So there'll be quite a lot of pain and maybe an inexperienced surgeon would be another contra relative contraindication there. Uh, complications are always airway obstruction, aspiration, conversion of the GA can be quite a difficult thing to do in certain positions. Seizures, nausea, vomiting, dysphoria, air embolism as well. So a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, so again, a very experienced team is vital for this. Preparation. So uh, but broadly speaking, you know, patient selection, counseling, obviously really important. Art line, IV on the ipsilateral side. Uh, so you can essentially have someone, you know, to, you, can, you can get them to move um, parts of their body as required. Second IV in the foot, empty bladder, obviously pretty important. And you may be running anything from Remy, Profol, Dexmedetomidine, plus you want a warming blanket uh, and they've got condi in here, but yes, Dexmedetomidine sounds like a very titratable agent to use. And they talk about the asleep, awake, asleep, but essentially, yeah, as, as Matthew's talked about, you can do this uh, with the patient just really well sedated, breathing spontaneously, dexmedetomidine, plus a really good scalp block. Um, does it, has anyone done a scalp block before who wants to talk, talk us through it? I can try. Okay. Um, I've forgotten some of the details, but I'll have a go. Okay. Um, so a scalp block is effectively a ring block for the scalp. Um, okay. um, the two initial blocks involve blocking um, the V one aspect of the facial nerve. Um, so you can usually block them in the plane of the, um, uh, just above the eyebrow, you can basically do, I'm just gonna sh um, go sub cut centrally and along the plane of the eyebrow to block the supra orbital nerve, I think it is. Yeah, so so supra orbital and supra trochlea, and you can really feel just the divots there. And, there's, yeah. the, and the funny thing about those is those actually just take out most of the sensation up to the vertex of the head. So they're incredibly useful that you can, you know, like a one, one mil of 1% lignocaine just covers that for ages. Uh, that's good. Keep going. Um, and then the next one is the V2 branch of the um, trigeminal nerve, which I think is the auriculotemporal nerve. Uh -huh. um, and that's blocked halfway between the eyebrow and um, the oh, that's, that's of the ear. That's the zygomatico I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. That's, but that's right. The angle of the eye to the tragus, kind of midway, but realistically, I'll just put a whole bunch of local in that region. And the one you're talking about, auriculotemporal, is just behind here. But again, it's a ring block. I'm just going to put a whole bunch of local around there because I'd rather it work than um, I'm not using big volumes anyway. Uh, keep the going. Last two is between um, between the um, posterior aspect of the ear and the um, orbital notch at the back. Um, I've put in the names of them, but you basically do a ring block between those yeah, to get the blood. Yeah. What are the names of those nerves? Oh, is posterior the auricular. Is it? Uh, so auricular temporal was back there yeah. and then you've got your lesser occipital and greater occipital. Lesser greater occipital, that's right, yeah. Fantastic. So yeah, what I do is give Remy or whatever you want, you'd end up um, you know, giving enough analgesia to start with um, uh, local anesthetic to block the nerves. Um, and obviously you can use three milligrams per kilogram and can dilute that depending on how much you need. Uh, and again, you know, when, when I've done this, I haven't worried too much about the anatomy. I'll know the names of them, but essentially I'm doing a ring block uh, to try and numb it. And it's just really effective. And with the right, you know, with 1% with ropivacaine, you can you know, give so much, it, it can give so much um, longevity to that block. Uh, and you might even put it at spe specific locations where the head pins are as well. Uh, in, the, in this setting where they're inserting the head pins, again, uh, so often they'll put the LMA in after this point to then uh, insert the head pins, but then you awaken them to ask if they're comfortable. You access the cortex asleep. So unlike what Matt was saying, depending on what the situation is, depending on the procedure, depending on the surgeon, 
you will in, you know, give propofol, insert the LMA, drape everything, and then you'll dissect down to this set, to the, um, to the site you're operating on, and then awaken the patient for a section. Uh, so when the dura is open, decrease propofol and REMI, remove the LMA, and you might give some questions about, for whatever you need about the resection. You would then resect the tumor and then asleep to close. So you deepen the anesthetic, put the LMA back in and close. Um, this is all in theory. I uh, ha haven't done it myself. So uh, there'll be, like, like most things in anesthetics, there'll be a lot of variation depending on what the lesion is and the surgical practices as well. Yeah, I'm just moving on because there's obviously a lot, lot to cover here. Uh, craniotomy. So again, we're going to go through some frameworks here. So pre-op assessment for craniotomy. A 50-year-old female for metastatic tumor in the brain. Previous breast cancer was resected five years previously. What do you want to know on pre-op assessment? Uh, so I want to know, explore more about the tumor. Um, so in terms of specifically the four or five M's, okay. um, meaning, <laughs> so mass effect, where it's metastasis, metastasized to, and the implications, um, metabolic effects, usually like paraneoplastic issues, um, the medications, so particularly chemotherapy and the, neuro, uh, the sequelae of those. And, and also the mental state, because they're typically depressed. Okay. Um, and that's really good. So if every, anyone hasn't um, knows that structure, I just find it a useful structure. You know, usually all your organ problems are severity of stability cause complications, and that's very useful. But cancers are, cancers are very specific in the sense that, you know, they, they, their severity is often mass effect and metabolic issues. And you might not think about that normally. So the, the ma mass effect metastases and metabolic helps to identify the severity and stability in cancer issues. And then there's other stuff like, um, you know, what medications are on, but often they'll have lots of impact. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy um, often has a really big impact on what you do, especially with your airway and other things like your hematological function. Uh, so mass effect, all of these things, METs, is it the primary, is it secondary, a whole bunch of metabolic things that might be an issue. You, you know, your electrolytes might be out of, out of whack as well. And then I'm looking at all the usual stuff as well, cause complications, specialist meds. Because you, you know, what, what caused this breast cancer initially? Is it something, you know, is it something else that needs to be managed? Um, and you know, what, you know, what was, or what was the cause of this MET? Good. And then examination. Actually, the, the one thing I would like you to say, so I, you know, I, my usual anesthetic assessment, I'd assess those five M's and just go through them, but then I'd do a thorough examination as well and investigations for these things. Probably the extra step to that answer is probably worthwhile saying as well. Okay, let's go through some transphenoidal surgery. Carolyn, so I mean, what, what are we often resecting with this approach? So often for a transphenoidal approach, uh, it's to gain access to the pituitary. So it's often patients with uh, adenomas um, that obviously then therefore that has impacts upon your preoperative assessment and, and how you manage these patients. Great. And what's your preoperative assessment aside from the usual stuff? What's the aside from the usual stuff. So I want to know exactly what the pituitary issue is. Mm -hmm. So um, is it that it's causing is it a macro adenoma that's causing mass compression and therefore issues and that's why it's being resected and or is it secreting hormones that are, are causing issues and yep. how has that been managed thus far in terms of endocrine involvement and medications that they may be on Excellent. um and then i'm going to try and understand the sequelae of those things so if it is has got mass effect then that has implications in terms of icp management um, and seizure prevention and things. Uh, and then obviously the, the metabolic aspects in terms of the drugs that they may be on and um, the consequences that they might have. And yeah, that's really good. And again, you, you hit my framework exactly the way I'd want to frame this. I'm trying to hit the points of difference of this case versus other cases. So this is now all my usual anesthetic stuff, but I'm also worried now about its pituitary surgery is either mass effect or metabolic effects. So that's re that's really great. And each meta, depending on what the what's offered, if it's Cushing's, it's a whole bunch of stuff. If it's acromegaly, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and to know those specifically is very useful. Um, intraoperatively, so the, you know the way I think about this is it's a just a very glorif glorified long fess and craniotomy with maybe VA, venous air embolism problems. But then all the other, so those are the specific things that I care about now, aside from long surgery, access issue, issues, 
maybe there's lots of adrenaline used, a throat pack is used, uh, and there's potential for major hemorrhage because of carotid sinus and cranial nerve damage. So a whole bunch of other stuff that might be going on. Um, and really useful, just have a list of these things in your mind that you can rattle off. And then post-operatively, diabetes insipidus in about 40%, pituitary hypofunction and prophylactic corticosteroids might be required. And you might get CSF rhinorrhea as well. Um, okay, so let's say you get this recovery room emergency. So imagine this patient with a 50-year-old, a 50-year-old with a prolactinoma, type 2 diabetic on insulin, ex-smoker, five pack year history, asthma with control, controlled with serotide and mental occasional use, uh, but no cardiovascular problems. They've got no allergies and no issues from the prolactin secretion uh, with medical management. Um, but in PACU, post the transplantal hypophysectomy, which is a long operation, say it's 14 hours, uh, the, the patient, the case you've now taken over uh, because you've, the, your, your colleagues needed to go home, now having difficulty breathing, patient seems to be struggling with small tidal volumes and noisy breathing. The SATs are decreasing and you, you're called in, not fully conscious after extubation. Uh, and you're the only doctor nearby as the anesthetist in the emergency uh, is in the ED with a failed airway. Uh, you need to manage the situation. Um, hey, Carolyn, do you want to have a go at this? Sure thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go and attend the patient in recovery. And the first thing I'm going to do is try and to make the patient safe whilst scanning the monitors for any immediate uh, information that they may give me. So I'm going to ensure that the patient's on high flow oxygen, uh, preferably with a non-rebreathing mask at 15 litres. Mm -hmm. And whilst I'm looking at that, like I said, I'm going to be looking at the monitors. So I'm going to be checking their heart rate, their blood pressure, their saturations. Um, uh, and whilst uh, doing that, I'm then going to do a A through D assessment of the patient, mm -hmm. get handover from the anaesthetic nurse who's been looking after the patient and also have a, a look at the anaesthetic chart. My top differentials in this patient are going to be um, surgical related issues, patient issues or anaesthetic issues. And I'm gonna try and rule those out sequentially. So the anesthetic issues are kind of similar to the failure to wake issues. So those are residual anesthesia, such as um, you know, sedatives, opioids, neuromuscular blockers. So ensuring that the patient's completely reversed. Yes. Um, uh, uh, then I would go on to, I guess, uh, surgical factors. So edema is highly likely in this kind of patient. Uh -huh. um, uh, just then, to give you information, so let's say you've gone through all the medications, opioids, everything looks normal from that. They've been properly reversed. Neuromuscular function has returned completely. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't look like they have excessive opioids. Pupils aren't pinpoint. Volatile has been washed out completely, uh, mm -hmm. as you saw on the end title was zero or 0.1. Mm -hmm. uh, you are hearing the noisy breathing. Keep going. Um. So that kind of rules out most of the anaesthetic drug related issues. There's still the possibility that this patient is having airway issues related to the placement of the tube. So they could have uh, airway or laryngeal edema. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds like you're trying to tell me that the patient has stridal. Yep. Um, so I would do a, a full uh, A and B assessment. So uh, ensuring the patient has an open patent airway. Yes. Um, and if they are, you've said that they're not fully awake. So I'd apply airway adjuncts if the patient's going to tolerate those. So a nasopharyngeal or a Goodell airway uh, to maintain an open airway. So you try the Goodell, it does, the patient doesn't tolerate that very well. Mm -hmm. The nasopharyngeal goes in, um, but you're still getting the noise. Like it's, it's not help the stridal. Okay. Um, so then I would move on, uh, keeping in the back of my head that I think this sounds like post extubation stridal. Um, I would have a quick assessment of the ventilation and the breathing of the patient. So look, listen, feel. Um, it's obstructed kind of seesaw breathing yep. uh, and just very noisy upper airway obstructive sounds. Okay. So it does sound like this patient has got a potentially upper airway obstruction due to edema. So I'm going to uh, treat the situation by giving the patient an adrenaline nebulizer and also giving the patient IV uh, dexamethasone. Um, so them, how much adrenaline do you give? How do you give that? Uh, so you can give it neat. So you give uh, five mils of the, so I think it's five milligrams. So you get the normal uh, IV uh, ampule and put that into a nebulizer. So five milligrams of that, which is five mils. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the dexamethasone, I'd give an airway dose. So I'd give 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. After the perianal burning, the patient stops reacting and uh, it actually hasn't helped. All right. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to re- In spite of 100% oxygen with a 
bag uh, with a Liddell bag. Sorry, what percent did you say? Oh, let's say it's 89%. 89%. Okay. So we're reaching an unsafe stage in this patient's airway management. And I'm concerned that this patient is going to need a fairly urgent reintubation for management of their airway. Mm -hmm. So towards that end, if I had anyone else available to assist me, so you've told me I don't have another anesthetist, no. but if I had a senior trainee or a fellow to help me, then that would be great. How you, how you um, I am going to, uh, collect my the personnel that I can have to assist me. So that would include a trained uh, an airway nurse. Mm. Um, I'm going to gather my equipment. So for this patient, I would grab a video laryngoscope, a bougie and a difficult airway trolley. Mm. Um, I'm going to ensure that I have drugs available for uh, intubation. So mm. for induction of this patient. Um, and then also for maintenance of anesthesia once the patient is asleep. Yep. What do you give? Um, so I am going to give this patient, um, so I would review what the patient had had in surgery, but my initial, yeah, let's uh, say said, um, 50 rock uranium, a few doses, a few doses of that throughout sure. reverse with Sugamidex, uh, sure. 200 profile at the start of the case and say 200 of fentanyl. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give the patient, um, two milligrams per kilogram of IV fentanyl. I'm going to give them two milligrams per kilogram of a propofol uh, and I'm going to give them a milligram per kilogram of rock uranium to even, secure the airway. Even after the Sugamidex? Oh, you've given Sugamidex. Sorry, I forgot you said that. Uh, I'd use succimethonium a milligram per kilogram. That's good. Uh, as you go in, you see a big throat pack there and you take it out and everything resolves. Fantastic. <laughs> good. Hey, so uh, you did well with that. So the, the, the good thing about that is you tackled a couple of different things. So this is about as, comp this gets really complicated because as everyone can feel when you're in that situation, not only you have a, fair, a partial decreased conscious state patient, but you also have noisy breathing mm -hmm. um, and you quickly ruled out a few things. You know, you might, you might also say, look, just check all the vital signs on the monitor, but you said that. So you check all the, you did say check all the monitors. So I would have offered you, you know, the SATs are low or whatever. You checked the pharmacological aspects of this. And then you went straight to the fact that, look, this, this is airway compromise. So I'm going to assess and manage that. I said, Strider, you optimize with Gedel, nasopharyngeal and oxygen. That didn't fix it you alerted yourself that you're going to progress down to intubation of this patient, you got everything ready and great. So, you, you know, with this situation, you're always en going to end up getting to the solution if it, if it is a throat pack and hopefully it doesn't cause a, a rest uh, sooner than that. But no, that was really good. Uh, would, would you, if you, I mean, uh, I must admit that it, I didn't tweak to the fact that it could have been a throat pack. Would you say ideally in this situation that you would check for that earlier? I mean, that's going to be difficult to look for yeah, in a yeah. hypoxic patient like oh, suppose yeah. you could stick your sucker down but you're not going to necessarily be able to pull it out are you no and all you can do realistically is go this could be a throw pack and what was the um sign out yes yeah. this, this used to happen not not uncommonly when we didn't have the throw pack on the surgical uh count and it used to be just part of the anesthetic count and because it's a handover case with you know redressing and redraping the throw pack would get for forgotten because of the handover issue and it's a long case so you mm. know when you do a throw pack for, ton for, not for tonsils, sorry, but for fesses, you just never imagine that that's going to be left behind. It's always these long cases and that's where it happens. So obviously we've got better systems now and that hasn't happened in a long time from what I've heard. Yeah. Can I just make a, a quick comment. Um, yeah, go for it. I, did, I've just, I was lucky enough to do a couple of vibers with um, mm. one current and one ex-examiner and yeah. a similar story, essentially a stratering, an upper airway obstruction type case hmm. and both of them made the point to if the patient unless they're imminently crashing don't induce and paralyze the patient if you don't know what's going like if you if they're giving you that story of that you know they're breathing their sats aren't good at all yes. then take the time to and plan for a like a spontaneously ventilating induction Oh, okay. in the way of like an awake fiber. And I think that would also give you, if you topicalized and you went in and you see the throat pack immediately, you haven't put the patient off to sleep. And so- What was the reason for not just doing an induction to get a tube in? Well, because you've got, if you've got time, you don't know what you're up against at this stage. So you've got a stridering patient that you don't know the pathology of. You don't know how big the airway is. You don't know what you're going to get in and get past. Yep, yep. Um, 
and they think they're just saying you don't know how the difficult of the airway. And if it's if it's declared now, this is obviously the Viva game, but yeah. that I I actually was one of the earliest ones I did, and I failed the Viva because I induced the patient. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I've got to, I've got to say, from what, what, from what I know, the examiners definitely have some their own expert consensus opinions about stuff, which is worthwhile knowing. So, Matt, thanks for that. This is very good to know that that's a, a current and an ex examiner who said that. I, I, I don't know. I, and I agree with you. In the, I, I don't disagree with you. So, in reality, if someone desats to a crazy level, if you know, mm. essentially getting obstructed, of course, we'd all induce. There's no other option. And then cut the neck if required if the swelling is too much. Um, but in this situation, I'm giving you a certain amount of badness, but I haven't said it's deteriorating. So maybe that's a conversation to have. Yeah. It's it's hard for me to yeah, it's hard for me to go with that because I know how you know an un uh, already sedated patient, striderus, he can just see that you know there's no evidence either way. But yeah. I, I see I, I, yeah. I think that's really useful what Matt said. So you know just to change up everything. If that is something the examiners have said, or potentially what they've said, it'd be worth stating these problems. And what I'd say is, this is difficult because the stridor may be due to swelling and may, may declare that this airway will be very difficult to manage. You know, if, if I've paralyzed the patient, it may be impossible to manage. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if the patient was deteriorating rapidly, I would, uh, you know, intubate the or do a rapid sequence, intubate the patient, be prepared for cutting the neck or front of neck access. But if they were stable enough with what I'm giving them, I would have a more cautious approach, but also ready if the patient deteriorated. So maybe I'd have a look with a fibroscope to see if there's a throat pack there. So yeah, you can always put a fibroscope down very easily and check the yeah. surrounding areas like a nasendoscopy and you've got the ENT yeah. guys there anyway. So I, I think I, I would agree with you actually. So yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's modify that and go with what Matt said, because that's what the examiner said. And it is actually quite easy. But, to I practice. also, the only other thing is that I, in a very similar scenario in this the vibe that I did, I assumed that the airway wasn't patent and which is why I thought it was an obstructed airway. Oh, yeah. I wasn't very good at asking for, you know, or saying if, you know, if I could still see, you know, air moving, fogging of the mask and the sats weren't dropping precipitously, I would do this. And if they then say, no, there's nothing, they're not moving, they're seesawing, you know, they're obstructed, fine. You've you, you yeah. do what you can because that's Kaiko now. Or, yeah. But um. And I just thought it was an interesting learning point and I've tried, tried to share the love because <laughs> it wasn't very fun when I had to do failed front of neck access until I got told at the end that the Bible was failed. <laughs> oh, okay. No, thank you. No, really appreciate that. Um, um, just as a, a very small side thing, um, would you be able to comment on um, thyroid dysfunction as a cause of failure to emerge? Just not super familiar with it. Yeah, me neither. I'm not too familiar with it. It's one of the differentials. If someone's very hypothyroid, um, and there's a whole bunch of other metabolic things that may cause uh, altered conscious state uh, or electrolyte abnormalities or you know, very seriously hypo hypothyroid, that could be a reason for failure to emerge. I've never seen it. I don't know too much about it. Uh, if you find out more, let me know. Um, I just have one more thing. I guess the other thing I was thinking is like in yeah. this scenario, um, I would probably quickly take the patient back to theatre to do the airway, not leave them in recovery. Um, yeah. As well. yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good point. And that would be an easy way to do it. Thanks. Just a quick question about the uh, nasal, the, is it nasal. sort of considered a, the nasal pharyngeal airway considerations in someone who's had oh. transthenoidal? Um, whether yeah, I, I wouldn't do that because uh, they may, they've got, they, that's the operative site. That would be kind of risky to do, wouldn't it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the only thing no. that I thought was a little bit. No, that's right. Um, yep. <laughs> I, I accept that as well. I think, I think we both. <laughs> Forgot that they just operate on there, but that's fine. So hyperventilation, CNS, all fail. So all failure to emerge causes, as we mentioned, bis farm neuro and other. Then poor muscle function causes a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, but let, let's move on because we've already talked about that probably in Len. Uh, so just a bit about ICP monitors, and we're pretty much done. So on time for eleven thirty. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Um, list the methods of assessing intracranial pressure. Uh, and about the role of ICP monitoring in the setting of traumatic brain injury. Again, a pretty specific question. Assessment methods, non-invasive clinical CT signs and invasive intraventricular catheter EVD or a Codman's. Now, just to go through kind of a combination of notes and what the examiners have reported, there's a strong correlation between ICP and traumatic brain injury. 
well established and recommended to you know, have this monitored in TBI and allows for assessment of your cerebral perfusion pressure because you're not assuming it's 20. It can be diagnostic and therapeutic, especially if you can you know, drain uh, CSF temporarily and maybe an in, the first indicator of a worsening status, allows detection of impaired autoregulation and the ICP waveform indicates brain, uh, can indicate brain compliance as well. It's also relatively cheap and the treatment of ICP without monitoring may have a risk. Uh, the risks are, look, there's no actual RCT supporting ICP monitoring as when I wrote up this lecture, if anyone knows about anything different, please let me know. The infection risk increases after five days. There's also a risk of hemorrhage on insertion. Like it's pretty brutal when they, when they go in blind with that, you're thinking, wow, how are you just doing that? Uh, there's typical insertion with brain swelling and ICP may not be uniform everywhere. So this site here, having the ICP measurement, that doesn't necessarily correlate, co correlate to other parts of the brain. Um, so that was my framework for that answer. Uh, so this is the summary slide really. So we've gone through positional issues often come up in your SAQs. ICP monitors comes up in your SAQs as well. Awake crany and the framework of, um, you know, what we need to do for that transfernoidal surgery and some recovery room issues and a format for that. And thanks Matt for that uh, information as well is really useful. Uh, and a PACU emergency we've talked about. Um, Hey guys, thanks so much for listening um, and participating in that. Thank, and, you know, again, asking questions to people on the fly, really, really, you know, putting people on the spot. I think it helps you learn, it, it, you know, it makes it more interactive as well. So thanks for being part of that. Thanks, Lahiru. Thank you. Thanks, that was awesome. Thanks, Lahiru. So worth wait, staying up for. <laughs> <laughs> and go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, see ya.